Welcome to our total joint class. Today we'll be talking about knee replacement surgery. My name is Dr. Cerna. I'm one of the orthopedic trauma and reconstructive specialists here. I do do adult hip and knee replacements. This is our team. Many of you will recognize the names of your providers here, but we like to say that you might be seeing many of these providers while you're in the hospital or throughout your dealings, so it's a good thing to become familiar with all of them. So the goals for people in watching this video and attending the class are to recognize that knee replacement is a reliable operation to relieve pain and restore function. Also to describe what to expect about the knee replacement procedure itself and to discuss the risks of the surgery. Overall, we want you to get a good introduction to the entire process from start and hopefully to finish through the end of your recovery. So the goal of your knee replacement is to improve your quality of life, and we do that by relieving pain and restoring function. And with function, we mean knee movement and alignment. We also hope to increase your activity and get you back to doing those things that you love to do. Expectations. An artificial knee is not a normal knee. It's expected to have some clicking, some swelling, some stiffness, some difficulty kneeling, and also some numbness on the outside part of the knee. And your surgeon should talk to you about all of these. So first we'll overview knee arthritis. Essentially what that is is inflammation of the knee joint because of loss of cartilage and it leads to narrowing of your joint spaces. So on the right hand side here you see a relatively normal looking knee, good spaces between the two bones here. And on the left hand side you see what happens when a knee becomes arthritic. You lose some of the joint space, these bones are almost touching. Some of you might hear us use terms like bone on bone disease. And you also see this, that's where the arrow is pointing to, but you also see that this platform looks like it's sliding out from underneath the thigh bone. And that will sometimes happen and we call that subluxation. We also see bone spurs forming in through here and it just makes the knee a little bit rougher and doesn't move as well. These arrows here are pointing to bone spurs and as the cartilage wears, these bone spurs develop and they can cause some stiffness. The surgical technique, what we really do is we resurface the bony surfaces with metal and we use plastic in between the two to take the place of your cartilage. We balance the ligaments because that's how we make your knee or that's how your knee stays stable. And we restore the alignment and the motion, which essentially means we hope to straighten the leg. A lot of people's legs will move one way or the other as the arthritis develops and you might notice that your knee looks a little crooked. What we use most commonly are metal and plastic. The metal that we use is called a cobalt chrome alloy and the plastic, we essentially call it poly or polyethylene. It does have a longer name, but you don't have to worry about that. The end of the femur is capped with a metal component and that's this piece here. The end of the tibia has a metal plate with some pla or, or plastic and a plastic spacer will go in between here. You can barely see the shadow of the plastic spacer here. A plastic button may also be applied to the bottom of the kneecap or underneath the kneecap. Here, if the kneecap is worn, you can see that we cut this flush or cut it flat, and then we put a plastic button here. Implants come in multiple sizes. There are instruments that we use to measure the size of your bones to determine the most appropriate fit. Women typically require smaller implants and all companies have implants that fit both men and women in a variety of sizes. The incision that we make is made in the front of the knee, usually from just above the kneecap down to the bump on your shin bone. The length of the incision depends on the thickness of the soft tissues. We'll make the incision long enough so that we can see the area around the knee and see everything that we need to do. As surgical techniques and implants and instruments continue to improve as technology advances, we try to use smaller and smaller incisions as allowed. We will use techniques and we strive to use techniques to spare muscle. On the day of surgery, you meet your surgeon in the surgical prep and recovery area where they will, they will initial your knee and answer any final questions that you may have before the actual operation. You'll meet the staff from the operating room. You'll also meet the anesthesiologist and they'll answer any questions that you have about those parts of the procedure also. You'll then go to the operating room first and then you'll come out to what we call the PACU or the post-anesthesia care unit, which is our recovery room. Surgery itself will last one to two hours and recovery, and recovery lasts one to two hours and from there you will go to the medical surgical unit up on the fourth floor of the new hospital tower. 
Pain control is something that we talk about a lot in this process. Our goal is to control your pain after surgery to allow you to begin moving around and participating in therapy. We do expect, and you should expect, some discomfort and soreness. This is a major surgical procedure and reconstruction, but this should gradually improve as time passes. Everybody's a little bit different. While we can try to expect and anticipate how much pain you will have, everybody has a different experience. There is a difference between no pain and controlled pain. We use what's called a multimodal pain regimen, which basically means we use combinations of different medicines to optimize your pain relief, and they all target different pathways of the pain, of the pain phenomenon. We use analgesic medications like Tylenol, anti-inflammatory medications like Toradol, also ibuprofen, Aleve, Celebrex. We use nerve medications or neuropathic medications like Neurontin, muscle relaxants like Valium and Flexeril. And of course, we use narcotics like your oxycodones and your morphines. Doses are usually started preoperatively and they will continue during your hospital stay. Intraoperative treatments such as joint capsule injections are also performed. IV medications now are the exception rather than the rule, and we hope to minimize the amount of narcotics that you use because we realize that narcotics will affect more than just your pain. Positional changes, breathing, relaxation techniques, massage, they're all part of our multimodal pain control protocol. Postoperatively, physical and occupational therapy is very important for a good outcome, and particularly for knee replacements, we stress a lot of therapy and range of motion for the first six weeks. Your participation is very important and will improve your result, and you'll hear us talk to you about that over and over again. Therapy starts generally the day after surgery. If you do have your surgery performed really early in the morning, you may see the therapist the day of your surgery. And it's really important for you to follow the therapy plan. While you're in the hospital, other doctors will take care of your non-orthopedic issues, such as any high blood pressure or diabetes or heart or lung disease that you might have. A hospitalist medicine physician will see you after surgery. If you are not getting a medication you think you should, please ask. Alternatively, if you're getting a medication and you're not sure why you're getting it, please ask. We do often make changes to some of your regular medicines during your hospital stay because of your surgery, and it's really important to address this with your primary care physician preoperatively also. I grew up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. I hail from a family of physicians. My father, in fact, retired from Mayo Clinic Health System after 34 years. As a young child growing up, I could sense that my father was doing important things to help people, and I could tell that he enjoyed his work, and that inspired me to follow in his path. As I approached the end of my training, I had to decide what field of medicine would suit me best. I eventually chose hospital medicine. A hospitalist is a physician who specializes in the treatment of hospitalized patients. While an outpatient general physician treats a variety of conditions in the clinic setting, hospitalists care for patients whose condition requires hospitalization. We take the place of your outpatient physician during that time period. Following discharge, you will return to your outpatient physician. That doctor has full access to all details regarding your hospital stay. The hospitalist team provides daily, round-the-clock medical care for the patient until the time of discharge. The term, hospitalist, was first coined in the mid-1990s in response to a growing trend in modern medical care. Since that time, hospitalist programs across the country have increased rapidly. The reason for the specialization in hospital-based medicine is simply better patient care. Unlike an outpatient physician who has obligations in the clinic, the hospitalist is present at the hospital throughout the day, making it easier to respond to test results quickly and accommodate the patient's changing needs. Multiple studies over the years have indicated that patients under the care of hospitalists have better outcomes in shorter stays, which in turn leads to lower costs. At Mayo Clinic Health System in Eau Claire, we founded a hospitalist program in 2003. Since then, the scope of the practice has expanded considerably, and we have added hospitalist programs at Barron, Bloomer, and Osseo. Our hospitalist team cares for a variety of patients and conditions including diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, emphysema, strokes, kidney disease, and infections. We also commonly consult on surgical patients to provide a medical opinion on multiple issues. 
Patients are assigned to a specific hospitalist during their stay. Due to the nature of our shifts, however, the doctor who admits you may not be the same doctor who discharges you home. Communication is key in our program. We need to be able to communicate effectively between ourselves, consulting physicians, nurses, therapists, and the patient's family doctor. Most importantly, we need to communicate well with you and your family. This helps to ensure excellent patient care at every level. We know that medical information can be very technical and complicated. Therefore, we encourage patients and their families to ask questions of the hospitalist so that they understand both their illness as well as their treatment. It is essential to remember that we work for you and your needs come first. We want you to understand your condition so that you can collaborate with us to help make the best decisions for your medical care. So now we'll talk about some of the risks of the actual procedure. We talk a lot about blood clot prevention because you are at risk for a blood clot after knee surgery. You may have a tuba grip after surgery to help control swelling. That's a compression stocking on your leg. You will have calf squeezers or sequential compression devices, SCDs, that are used when you're in the hospital and should be worn whenever you are in bed or in a chair about 18 hours a day. Anticoagulation medicine will be given during your hospital stay, and for most patients, aspirin only after discharge. If you are taking blood thinners, usually, please discuss this with your surgeon as we will try to get you back on your routine medicines after a period of time has passed that's appropriate. We also may use your routine medicines as your blood clot prevention. Generally, you're at high risk, greater than 20% or more, if you are not treated and the reason we are concerned about this is because clots that form in the legs can go to the lungs and can be fatal. Your risk is reduced to 1% or less if we treat with medication and squeezers and getting out of bed and walking helps to prevent blood clots more effectively than almost anything else. Infection. You will get antibiotics at the time of surgery and for the 24 hour period around your surgery. Surgeons, assistants, and scrub techs wear space suits in the operating room and using all precautions, the risk of infection is approximately 1%. Infection may occur months or years after surgery, and an infection may require or may mean removal of your implants and almost certainly requires more surgery. So there's a picture of Dr. Brand, one of our joint surgeons on the left. These are the space suits that we wear. Everything that's touching blue is sterile. The anesthesiologist is sitting underneath the clock in the back of the room, and it's just an idea of the setup during surgery and how we try to keep everything sterile and clean. We generally use tourniquets during surgery to help prevent blood loss. There may be some bleeding into the knee after your surgery, and we check your blood count each morning afterwards to make sure that it is okay. If you have symptoms from a low blood count, you may need a blood transfusion. TXA, or transemic acid, is given before surgery and has been shown to decrease transfusion rates, and we use, and we use this now per protocol. Stiffness. It's painful to move the knee after surgery and some people will get stiff. You will need to work hard to prevent this stiffness, which means you'll need to follow the therapy plan. If you have limited range of motion at six weeks, we may need to perform another treatment under anesthesia. We encourage patients in general to wait as long as possible before getting their knees replaced because implants do wear with time. This wear rate is generally about 1% per year. However, the younger, and more, the, more, the younger and more active you are, the chances are you will wear this out perhaps a little bit faster. Revision surgery may involve changing the plastic or changing one or both of the metal parts, and it is certainly more challenging with a more difficult recovery. Medical complications can occur. Surgery is a major stress to your body. Heart and lung problems, stroke, stomach problems, constipation, they can all happen. A physical with your regular doctor and an EKG are required before surgery. Despite all of these precautions, unforeseen medical complications can, may still occur. And again, we stress that you take the time out to discuss your regular medical issues and regular medications with your primary care physician because some of these medications may need to be altered or stopped for your surgery. You will meet the anesthesia providers on the day of surgery. They'll discuss your anesthetic options, such as whether to undergo general anesthesia, a spinal anesthetic, epidural anesthesia, or perhaps even a nerve block. Nausea and vomiting are common, but more serious side effects or complications may occur. 
please tell your anesthesiologist of any past experiences with anesthesia, either in you or any member of your family. The recovery timeline generally dictates that after about six weeks, your walking should improve to near normal. It takes about three to four months to return to normal activity, about six months to feel like you're getting your normal endurance back, and 12 months for a full or maximal recovery. We focus on exercises for movement first and then strength following that. Getting back to work is very individual, so please check with your surgeon. In summary, knee replacements are reliable operations to relieve pain and restore function. As with any operation, there are associated risks. All of the precautions that we take are to minimize risk and to provide for a routine operation. And hopefully we did a, we did a good job with an overview into this entire process from start to finish. If you have any additional questions, I please ask that you address these with your surgeon and your team. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tracy Samuelson. I'm one of the triage nurses that works here at orthopedics at Mayo Clinic Health System here in Eau Claire. I'm going to be talking to you about what we do to get everybody ready for the joint prep class for hips and try and make the day a little bit easier to when you come in for surgery. Our goals are going to be discuss the steps to take you to get you ready for your surgical procedure, discuss uh, what to expect for the surgical experience and identify what you need to achieve the best outcome and re recognize why it's important for you to participate in your plan of care. We're going to help you plan ahead. We really want you to plan ahead to return home. Identify who will take care of you after you have surgery and plan for about two weeks after you have surgery. We, whether or not you're going somewhere for rehab or just straight home. We want you to simplify your meals. Plan for two weeks of easy or no preparation meals and any planned dental work. That should be done at least one month before you have surgery. Planning ahead, any of your regular doctor appointments for pre-surgery, we want you to have your blood work, your EKG, physical exams, and to discuss your medications. There's certain medications that you need to take and not take before you have surgery, and we definitely want to go through all those with your primary doctor. You also have an appointment with your surgeon, and we'll be discussing your final um, preparation for your surgery and when your surgery is and any kind of updates. If you do smoke, we'd like you to quit smoking because smoking does uh, delay the healing process. So we want to talk to your regular doctor about getting you some help. We want you also to talk with your surgeon about if you have a fever, cold, infection, or rash before your surgery date. Those things can um, delay your surgery. What to bring to the hospital? Loose, comfortable clothing, your personal items that you would need, medication list, a CPAP or BiPAP machine or mask, that is because the ones that you have at home do fit a lot better. Your joint prep uh, replacement information folder and just realize that Mayo Clinic Health System is not responsible for a lost or broken items. What not to bring to the hospital? Uh, large amounts of jewelry or uh, valuables, credit cards, money. You do not need to bring your medications. We have them all here. Mayo Clinic Health System is not re responsible for those lost or stolen items. And the day before your surgery, the surgical prep and recovery nurse will call you and they'll re review all your medications, what you should take the night before surgery and the day of surgery. They're going to tell you uh, when to eat, when to stop drinking uh, water or any other fluids, and when to smoke uh, and not smoke, any of those restrictions. Your hygiene instructions, when to wash up the night before or the morning of, of surgery. And remind you to call the day before and get the time that you're going to come to the, uh, your surgery. If you're going to be coming the day before, um, if you're coming on a Monday morning, we're going to have you call on Friday afternoon and find out the time that you would come in for that. If you're coming in for surgery on Tuesday, you would call Monday at 4 o'clock and find out the time of that surgery. The day of surgery, we'd have you take those medications that the surgical nurse had talked to you about, and then you would check in at the Mayo Clinic Health System reception desk. If you park in the parking ramp, you just walk down the long hallway, and it'll be this area right here by the registration. The day of surgery, you'll be taken to the surgical prep and recovery room, and you'll be asked your name and your date of birth many times by everyone who is in contact with you. This is done for your safety. Family and friends are welcome to come along, but do try to limit to that about two people on the day of surgery because the rooms are very small as you get started. 
surgical prep and recovery, the nursing administration, they'll get you going and uh, ask you many questions and ask, help you get ready for surgery. They're going to put those leg squeezers on. They're called SCDs. And they'll also have the anesthesiologist come in and talk with you and ask you whether or not you're going to have a general or spinal. This is also a time to talk to your surgeon and he will uh, initial on your uh, leg which uh, side that you're having surgery on. These are the leg squeezers or SCDs. You'll have those on while you're in the hospital during surgery and then after and pretty much when you're not up walking around. And they'll take you to the operating room and then that's when your family will go to the waiting room and they'll get a little card that tells you where you're going to be so they'll be able to keep in touch with you and they'll have a paging system. The operating room, you can see in this picture, they've got the monitors, antibiotics are hanging, surgical scrub team is there, the OR staff will communicate with your family throughout the surgery if there's any issues that they need to discuss with them. Then after surgery, you'll go to post-recovery room, the recovery room is also called PACU. Your nausea and your pain are controlled and during that time that you're there. When you're ready, you'll be transferred up to your hospital room and that is on the fourth floor of the med surge unit. Once you get up to the room, everybody will have oxygen, and that is a nasal cannula that you have in your nose. Everybody will have an IV in their arm. Everybody will be given an incentive spirometer, and you'll see one of these, and you'll be using that about 10 times every hour while you're awake. And the respiratory therapist will show you how to use that. Everybody will have a pulse oximeter on their finger, and that is to measure uh, what your blood, your pulse is, and then how well that your um, the oxygen is in your, um, in your blood. This is what that pulse oximeter looks like. It'll either be taped on or clipped on to your finger. Once you get up to your room, you, uh, we'll be checking on your vital signs very often. They'll also search you on your nutrition, and that'll be like clear liquids, and then you'll move up to sips, and then soups and ice cream, and then we'll just move you up to a general diet. Activity will be as tolerated that first evening. You may even sit up on the side of the bed if that is comfortable for you. But we will help control your pain and your nausea while you're in the hospital. Pain management. It is vital for you to describe your pain when, it, how, when and how and where it is located. We would like you to rate your pain. Zero is no pain and 10 is the worst. Why we do this is because we want you to use the medication the best it does. Otherwise, if it, uh, we give you too much medication, then you're not going to be able to get the best therapy and the best um, out of your surgery. We can use other things like distraction, position change, and just otherwise just relaxation. Our goal is to not scare you, but prepare you for the pain that you will have after surgery. After hip surgery, everybody will come up with a pillow bolster between your legs, and it'll be done so that you don't cross your legs while you're after you have surgery because everybody is a little bit sleepy. Ice will be also to your hip incision over your dressing, and that'll be done throughout the whole time that you're here in the hospital and then once you go home. When you're at home, we do want you to definitely use that ice uh, for any kind of pain. Hip precautions will be taught to you throughout the whole time that you're here in the hospital to prevent that dislocation. This is what that hip bolster looks like. That is only done for the first 18 to 24 hours while you're in the hospital, and then we use pillows. And then once you get home, then you can use pillows between your knees. Length of stay is typically about two to three nights. You can go home earlier if you're doing well, but the length of stay also depends on how well that you're doing and your insurance coverage. If you plan on staying um, and going somewhere for rehab, you do need to stay the three nights. Postoperative day one, your blood work will be done very early in the morning. That is done because the doctor comes in early in the morning and needs to see those results. Your pain control and is also going to be done during that uh, time, and we'll kind of switch back and forth on things that work the best. Anticoagulation is either going to be a certain medication or you could have injections, depending on what you and your surgeon have discussed. We'll also be taking care of your nutrition. So if you're just starting on clear, clear liquids, then we'll move you up to a little bit more general diet. Your physical therapist will be coming in that first day, and they'll also start getting you up twice a day already. You are the partner in your care. Postoperative day two. The post person that's going to be taking care of you when you go home should come in just so they can see how to get you in and out of bed, see how the safety is and how the activity, how physical therapy and occupational therapy work with you. This is a great idea to bring in some family that's going to be with you. Day three, discharge day. Uh, the, we want to prepare for you to be discharged anywhere between 11 and noon that day, but we do realize that if your family can't come in until later on in the day, then we will work with you. 
The person who's going to be taking care of you should come in and learn about the incision care. Everybody gets a certain uh, dressing that's on when they're in the hospital, and it's good that the family is, sees how to take that off, and we'll show them how to do that. We'll also talk about how to take your pain medication. It's good to, for the family to see when and how you act when you're in pain, so then they know to help you out with that when you're at home. If you're using any kind of anticoagulation, whether or not it's um, warfarin, if you were on that pre-op, or if you're going to be going home on aspirin, then it's a good time to listen to the pharmacist and the nurse talk about that. We'll also assist in getting your pain medication. Um, do realize that we cannot just call in your pain medications to the pharmacy anymore, so if you need to get a prescription, somebody needs to come here and pick up an actual prescription and take it to your pharmacy. And how to get in touch with your surgeon. It's good to call orthopedics clinics, or you can also call, use your patient online services, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But you are the partner in your care. How to control the swelling of your surgical leg. Physical therapy will talk to you a lot about that, and, but they'll also tell you that walking and icing is the other thing. Keeping your leg, um, your leg, affected leg elevated also is going to be, it says 20 out of 24 hours, and that means throughout the day. We don't want you just to sit in a chair or the recliner for 20 hours. We want that to be spread out throughout the day and just make sure that you get up and walk frequently. Elevation, this is a picture of what I was just explaining. Elevating the knees above the hips, toes above the knees, it helps decrease the swelling and the pain. This can be done while you're at home. After discharge, a person who's gonna be taking care of you should be available 24 hours out of the day. That ne doesn't necessarily mean right with you, but at least a phone call away. Just to help you at home the first couple weeks, help drive you to your appointments, and help to really to encourage you in your therapy and get you going in your progress. Bathing, you can shower with that dressing on. It is waterproof, so you, there is no worries about that, uh, as instructed about the doctor. But do not submerge it at all in any kind of bathtub, pool, hot tub, any kind of um, lakes or streams. Driving, we do want you to talk with your doctor about when is the best time to do this, but we want you to be off all your narcotic pain medications, be able to sit in the car comfortably, be able to move your foot from gas to brake um, easily, and practice in a safe area before you do this. Usually we talk about this at your 10 to 14 day post-op appointment, and then we'll tell you when it's safe for you to drive. This is a inside the folder that we'll be sending home with you. It's an orthopedic central pain management policy that we have. And it just discussed uh, what I had went into earlier, that all your prescriptions need to be on paper. We can talk to you about phone refills, but I cannot call them into any kind of pharmacy. Here are office hours. We are here 8 to 5, but the doctor is here usually about 8 to 4, and that is the best time to talk with them. So if you need any refills, it is best to call or send us a message to the patient online services, and we can get in touch with them. We do only give out limited supplies of prescriptions. We do want you to be in control with your pain, but we do not give out a severe amount of medication. So just know that if you do lo lose them, uh, we cannot give you another prescription. So if you have any questions about this, this is good to talk about with the doctor. This is just another way of what I had just mentioned about how you need to pick up your pain medications at the office, the, the prescription paper. Uh, you can, we can also send it through the mail. We can talk to the pharmacy here at our clinic. Um, do realize that if we do mail it to you, it does take anywhere from two to four days uh, with our mailing system, so it will take a while if that's the option that you pick. At your follow-up appointment, I mentioned about 10 to 14 days after your surgery, you'll be meeting with your doctor, and he'll be taking out your staples, give you some instructions about the incision, how to bathe, um, how to use your crutches or your walker or your cane, kind of discuss those things. This is also a perfect time to talk about your medications. If you need a refill, like you're almost out or you're not quite, you can talk about needing another prescription because you'll be in front of the doctor to get that. Also, we'll talk to you about dental procedures. I had mentioned earlier about how you need to have your dentist appointment, a cleaning or any kind of teeth um, extraction one month before surgery. We don't want you to have any kind of teeth cleaning or mouth, uh, any kind of tooth extraction for six months after surgery, unless it is a severe emergency. And that is because we don't want any kind of infection to get into your bloodstream and then go right to your brand new joint. This is also if once you get your dental or your protocol, after that is done, we will call in that prescription to your pharmacy of choice, and that will give you some refills so that you'll be able to go to your dentist, and you'll take the prescription one hour before you go to the doctor. 
And again, we'll talk about this all at your doctor appointment. This is patient online services. I had mentioned this earlier. This is a great way, it's a secure website that allows the patients to connect via internet. We can talk with your doctor through this. You can talk to any of, not just orthopedic doctors, but your primary doctor and your nurses. We can talk about your lab results. You can see your lab results. You can see your clinical notes. You can talk about your discharge uh, uh, instructions with your doctor on this. You can see a list of your medications. We can also go through prescription refills. You can send me an email and I can send you and tell you when your prescription is gonna be ready here at the desk. We can also look at when your upcoming appointments are or we can change those. If you have any questions about how to set up this patient online services, I can also help you with that here. And then we can help you get ready for your surgery. If you have any other plans we can, or any questions, you can go on to our website at the mayoclinichealthsystem.org and you can find out all the information there. Or you can call your orthopedics clinic at any time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nicole Marquardt. I'm a physical therapist here at Mayo Clinic Health System, and today we're going to talk about physical therapy following your total hip replacement. We're going to start out by giving you a few pieces of homework before you have your hip replacement. First, we'd like you to open your packet and find your handouts of the exercises that are on the right side of your folder. We'd like you to become familiar with that exercise handout and actually go ahead and start doing those once or twice a day, about 10 repetitions of each. We find that people who have already practiced these exercises have an easier time after their surgery doing them. Your second piece of homework is if you have a walker, go around your house and practice and be sure that you have plenty of room to get around. Um, we do recommend that you have a two-wheeled walker and not a four-wheeled walker. If you do have a walker, we'd like you to bring it to the hospital with you as well. Um, your therapy will start the day after your surgery. And in physical therapy, we work on the bigger motor tasks, things like your exercises, getting in and out of bed, moving from sit to stand, walking, and doing the stairs. Um, therapy will continue twice a day until you leave the hospital. We will start your therapy the first morning after the day of surgery. And again, we'll work on getting in and out of bed. The first morning, it just really depends on what you're up for. We'll start with your exercises. We'll get you sitting up. If that goes OK, we'll work on standing. At least try to get you up to a chair. And if you feel up to it, we'll even take a little walk. We'll continue to work on your mobility, going a little bit further each day, along with working on your exercises. You'll continue your exercises at home um, for about at least six months after surgery. We'll work on walking with an appropriate assistive device. We start most patients with a walker, but some patients do prefer to use crutches, especially if they have a lot of stairs in their home. Um, and again, you can bring that to the hospital with you. Especially if you're gonna borrow a walker or crutches, we really like you to bring it with you so that way we can make sure that it's the right size. Walkers and crutches actually both come in two different sizes. So if you're six feet tall and you're gonna borrow your husband's walker, who's five feet tall, okay, that was a bad example, switch it around, um, then the walker might not fit. So that's why it's really important that you bring it with you so we can be sure that it's in good condition, that it's safe, and that it fits you. And then we'll adjust it for you so it's just the right size for when you get home. We really like it if on the second day you have a family member come with you for the therapy session. And what we can do is the second morning when we're in therapy with you, we can set up a time and know that the family member who's gonna be your coach will be there with you in the afternoon, say at around two o'clock, and we can come back at two o'clock that afternoon. And what they can do then is they can watch how we coach you through your exercises, how we give you tips on how to get in and out of bed, and then that way they're ready to help you do that at home. So uh, after you have your hip, there's gonna be three rules that you have to follow. These rules are really important to prevent your hip from dislocating. The first rule is no crossing your legs. When you come out of surgery, you'll actually have a big wedge between your legs to remind you not to cross it. But this will be when you're in bed, when you're sitting, you can't cross those legs. The second is no bending your hip past 90 degrees. And that's the line between the side of your body and the big long hip bone. And the third is no turning your toes in, or what you would call pigeon-toed. And that's really important when you are reaching for something across your body. So if you're sitting, 
you got to reach for things with the hand that it's closest to. Or if you're turning, you can't do big turns. you got to take small turns and keep your nose and toes pointed in the same direction. And we'll practice this when you're walking, when you're getting in and out of bed, and we'll work with you throughout your hospital stay on learning these rules. Um, how much weight you can put on your hip varies after surgery. Some people are partial weight bearing, some people are full weight bearing, and we'll work with you with that. Um, after surgery as well, depending on what your surgeon gives us for a restriction. Um, exercises after discharge will be to walk. We want you to keep walking and gradually increase how far you're walking each day. You'll continue with those exercises that we discussed right at the beginning, the same ones that we'll work with you on in the hospital, will be the same ones that you'll continue doing twice a day. You'll add one repetition each time you do them and work up to 25 repetitions. And most patients don't have outpatient physical therapy after surgery if they just keep working on those exercises and gradually increasing their mobility. Um, if you have any questions, you can sure direct those to our physical therapy department or your surgeon. Hello, my name is Marilyn Berg. I'm one of the occupational therapists here at Mayo Clinic Health Systems. Uh, today I'm gonna kinda go through the occupational therapy uh, portion of your total joint class and hopefully give you some information to help you better understand what will happen to you during the hospital stay and what to prepare for at home. Occupational therapy is concerned primarily with uh, everyday skills of living, dressing, bathing, grooming, home safety, those types of things, and we certainly want you to be as independent as possible. <clears throat> What we do typically is work on the safest and most independent way for you to do the dressing, bathing, and toileting. We also want you to be participating as independently as possible at home and in the hospital. We want you to have functional strength to do your activities, and we want you to be as mobile as possible. What we will be helping you with is getting some of the equipment that might make you more independent. I did bring some samples today to show you of some of the items that are available. They're not mandatory, but they can certainly help you be more functional at home. One of the first items is the reacher. This can be used for not only picking up things that fall on the floor, but also getting your socks, underwear, I'm sorry, your pants and your underwear started. Uh, by just reaching down, it extends the length of your arm, so it makes it a whole lot easier for you to get your underwear and pants on without assistance. There's also the end of it here that can help you push everything back off. The sock aid is another item that you may or may not find helpful. A lot of people indicate they would love to have it now when they're having trouble reaching down to get their socks on. But there's several styles with this type it's a hard plastic. We start by putting the sock directly on the device, like so. You drop it down onto the floor next to your foot. You slide your foot in, and using both hands pulling on the cords equally, you pull your sock on and the device comes away. There are long-handled shoehorns that are available to help you slide your shoes on. They're just like a regular shoehorn. They're just longer and make it easier for you when you can't bend as well. The dressing stick is another option to help you. This hook on this end works similar to the reacher, where you can drape your underwear or your pants on to the end, lower it down to your foot, and then pull them on. The opposite hook helps push everything off, including your socks. Elastic shoelaces are available. Unfortunately, I don't have a sample to show you, but they look like a regular lace. And all the difference is they are elastic. So when you lace them into your shoe, you tie them in a knot so they don't come untied, and then they stretch as your foot goes in or out of the shoe. Just makes it much easier. The long-handled bath sponge is also an option. This is for washing your lower legs and your feet when you're struggling to reach those. Obviously, you can use it for your back or whatever other 
area that's hard to reach. But the primary reason we show this is for your lower legs and feet. I do have one other item that's not on the list that you see, and this is a leg lifter. This item can be helping you to lift and move your leg when you can't do it yourself. You simply put it over your foot, use your arm power to lift and move your leg, either in and out of the bed, in and out of the car, or wherever you're having trouble lifting your leg. This, however, does not substitute for your physical therapy exercises. A couple of the other things that are listed on the screen are a tub shower bench or a transfer bench. These are items that are helpful if you have trouble stepping over the side of the bathtub and also the raised toilet seat to make it easier for you to get on and off your toilet. If you have questions on how to get any of these items, the occupational therapist in the hospital can help you to obtain these. <clears throat> Before surgery, we want you to be thinking about safety at home. We want you to pick up any unnecessary rugs, things like by the kitchen or by the bathroom sink that you really don't need. Because there are things that you can trip on. There are different surfaces than your smooth floor. It's easy to catch your foot and fall. We want you to rearrange your kitchen so items that you use most frequently are in a chest to waist area. That way you're not reaching extensively overhead to one side, down low, where you can fall down. If you were ever thinking about installing any grab bars in your bathroom, now is the time to do that because they're very helpful with getting on and off a toilet. And we do want you to think about what chairs you're going to be sitting in at home. Chairs with arms are going to be the easiest for you to get in and out of. And also something that's very low and very soft will be very difficult. <clears throat> so think about that before surgery. When you're in the hospital, <clears throat> the occupational therapy staff does come and see you typically day two after surgery. We'll see you once a day and we'll work on bathing, dressing, home safety type skills. And if you need some exercises to strengthen your arms, we do work on those with you as well. We will come in and ask you some questions about your home setup. We want to know what types of obstacles you'll be dealing with. So be prepared to give us a brief summary of your home. We do talk about the home safety instructions. We talk about the equipment I just showed you, if you're interested. We do, as said before, instruct you in an upper body exercise program if you need it. And we do actually have you practice getting in and out of a bathtub if that's something that you have to do at home. We really want you to participate in all of the sessions we offer. There's no other way for you to know what you can do and how much help you'll need. And also this is good information for your caregiver. This is a picture of a practice bathtub with a standard bath chair. This would be something that you may have an opportunity to practice with while you're here. And if you have questions on how to get the bath chairs, please let us know. If you do have any questions or concerns prior to your surgery, please contact your physician or the therapy department and we'll be happy to help you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dana. I am a nurse case manager here at Mayo Clinic Health System in Eau Claire. I would like to give you a brief overview of how the social workers and case managers will get involved in your post-operative care. Social workers and RN case managers work in teams to assist you with insurance and funding issues, counseling and advocacy, transitional planning, and advanced directives for health care. Please make sure that the clinic or hospital has your correct insurance information 
um, prior to surgery so that we can preauthorize your procedure. Preauthorization for surgery can take up to 30 days to process. So the sooner we have your information, the better. Notification of surgery is not required for those patients who have straight Medicare. As Medicare rules do not um, require preauthorization. However, Medicare Advantage plans and private insurance companies do vary in their requirements. And many of them will require not only the hospital to contact them, but the patient as well. This may not be the case for all private insurance companies or all Medicare Advantage plans, but since it's difficult to tell you which companies um, do have that requirement, please just contact your insurance company and let them know of your surgery plans. If for any reason your insurer were to deny your procedure, the hospital would be notified and we would contact you. Once you are a patient in the hospital, your RN case manager will monitor your um, days in the hospital and contact your insurance company with um, updates and answer any questions or concerns that they have. We do realize that being in the hospital is a stressful event for not only the patient but their family as well. Meeting your emotional needs is important to all staff at Mayo Clinic Health System. If you or your family members have any concerns about your care or wish to talk to somebody, please let your staff nurse know and they will locate a social worker or a case manager. Lengths of stay in the hospital are decreasing nationwide. Your insurance company will authorize um, a number of days based on their criteria as well as your individual needs. In the hospital, your social worker or your case manager will meet with you to discuss your transition plan or what happens after you leave the hospital. As a team, you, your support people, your doctor, and your therapists will determine what is the best transitional plan to meet your individual needs. Home with outpatient services is an option for the person who is generally in very good health and will have somebody to stay with them the majority of time the first few weeks that they are out of the hospital. It is also the patient who has progressed very well during hospitalization with their therapies and is motivated to continue to perform them on a consistent basis while at home. Going home with home care is an option for the person who has a skilled nursing need or um, a skilled therapy need, such as uh, IV antibiotics or dressing changes. Do keep in mind that the maximum amount of therapy that uh, home care can provide is usually just twice a week. Medicare will pay for home care services if you are homebound and have a skilled nursing or a skilled therapy need. You must meet both of these requirements. Um, homebound means that you would have a great deal of effort um, to leave your home. Medicare will not pay for services such as meals, shopping, help with laundry, um, or housekeeping. Your um, private insurance companies and Medicare uh, supplement companies um, do require do uh, very greatly in what they cover. Um, so it's a good idea for you to contact your insurance company to see um, what their requirements are. Skilled nursing facilities are area nursing homes that offer short-term rehabilitation um, stays along with their long-term care. Generally, these areas are separated um, by wings or floors within the facility. This is an option for the person who requires um, more medical care than your family or friends could provide you at home. It might be for the patient who lives alone um, or is not going to be able to have somebody with them the majority of time those first few weeks postoperatively. It's also for the patient who might need extra help with their therapies or just that motivation to do them. Medicare. Um, We'll cover skilled nursing facilities uh, if you have a 
nursing need or a therapy need. You also have to have met um, a three-night inpatient stay in the hospital. The Medicare Advantage plans and private insurance companies um, sometimes do not have those requirements. So again, we would check with those insurance companies individually. Transition care units or swing beds are located in smaller rural hospitals and they um, provide care um, by hospital staff and uh, physicians. They're called a swing bed um, because uh, the hospital will uh, change the usage of the room depending on their needs. The swing bed is an option um, for a patient who has more of a skilled need than um, what a skilled nursing facility could provide, but yet they don't need um, the acute care setting of the larger hospital. Um, these would be your patients with a brittle diabetic who uh, needs a lot of blood sugar monitoring, insulin um, dosage changes, uh, complex dressings, um, history of heart disease, uh, and then also swing beds can provide a higher level of um, physical therapy and uh, occupational therapy. Medicare um, requirements are basically the same as for the skilled nursing facility. So you have to have the need um, as well as have had three nights um, in the hospital as an inpatient. And again, um, private insurance companies and um, Medicare Advantage plans vary. The other thing I would like to speak to you about is advanced directives for health care. Um, an advanced directive is a written document that speaks for you in times when you are unable to speak for yourself. There are two types of documents out there. Um, one is the living will, and the other is the health care power of attorney. Living wills are also called dec declaration to physicians. Um, the living will describes um, the types of um, life-sustaining measures you would or would not want if you were in a um, persistent vegetative state or had a terminal um, a condition that was going to result in death. Um, the living will uh, um, really only directs your health care providers in regard to usage and withdrawal of those life-sustaining measures. Um, it does not give anybody authority to speak for you. The power of attorney, which is also called health care power of attorney, is um, a more broad document it allows you to appoint somebody um, as an agent, as someone um, to speak for you uh, and make decisions for you if you are not able to speak for yourself. Your agent will work um, with your physicians and healthcare providers um, to make decisions in all types of um, healthcare needs, not just those life-sustaining measures. Uh, guardianship is a process um, that needs to be sought if you do not have a health care power of attorney in place. This can be a um, long and expensive process and it can add stress to your loved ones. This can usually be avoided if you have a health care power, healthcare power of attorney completed and on file. While you are in the clinic or the hospital, um, one of the Mayo Clinic Healthcare System social workers or chaplains can help you complete a healthcare power of attorney, and this is done at no charge. You could also have your personal attorney um, help you complete the document. They may um, charge a fee. Before um, you list agents on your document, it is a very good idea to have a frank conversation with those people. Um, to ensure that they are uh, willing to take on this responsibility. 
Uh, it is a good idea to review your document on a periodic basis um, to ensure that it still represents um, your wishes. Sometimes people will choose to change their agents or um, sometimes the agents listed are um, unable to be your agent um, any longer. Perhaps they've passed away or maybe they can no longer speak for themselves then they can't speak for you. Uh, you should store your document in a safe place, such as a bank safe deposit box, um, a fire box at home, or a safe at home. You should uh, give a document to your family members, a copy of the document, and you should also ensure that those who are listed as your agent in the document have a copy. Um, please bring a copy of the document to the clinic or the hospital. We will scan it into your, into your electronic medical record and it will continue to be on file. Um, if you make any changes to your document, you would need to um, provide us with a copy of the new document. Thank you.